calculating heat input from welding on quenched and tempered steels. Gary A. Pace, PECWI, Katy, Texas. So one thing as you get into welding, you're going to hear about heat input. Then you're going to be wondering, why do I care about heat input? You know, when I was welding on, you know, trailer frames and welding in high school, we never worried about heat input. You know, just weld the damn thing. Well, as you advance in welding, you're going to get into materials that are a little less forgiving than your garden variety carbon steels. You know, something you're making a boat trailer or a barbecue pit out of. So there's a couple of different things we need to look at. You know, and this is super complicated, and I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff I'm going to forget to mention. So I'm just going to, for this one, we're just going to basically talk about quenched and tempered steels, and then maybe I'll talk about stainless steels and duplexes and why we care about heat input on them, if I can put together something that's worthwhile. Anyways, um, when, you, when you're welding... You start out with two pieces of unaffected base material. And then you're going to weld it together. So then when you're done welding, you're going to have three different areas. You're going to have weld metal, heat affected zone, and an area of unaffected base material. So if we're welding something like um, a quenched and tempered steel, the people that made a quenched and tempered steel went through a great deal of um, processing to get certain specific mechanical properties into that material they quenched it they took it up to 2000 degrees you know up above the transformation temperature turned it all into austenite plunged it down quenched it turning it into a martensitic microstructure and then they brought it up to some temperature you know under a thousand degrees i'm assuming to temper the material so to take the hardness out of it so they there's a specific set of properties they want in that material well we're going in and we're trying to weld that stuff and if we don't follow their directions we're going to mess that steel up we're going to take the the hardness and the strength out of it or introduce um, zones where we could have cracking or we're going to have hydrogen induced cracking or there's just any number of things that we can do by welding it and not welding it correctly that is going to affect that material long term be it in the weld the heat affected zone or the unaffected base material so here we have the basic um, arrangements of atoms in um, the iron system this is how our iron atoms are put together um, on the far left we've got body centered cubic this is how iron is and steel is at room temperature. So if we heat it up and we go through a transformation temperature, all those little atoms are going to go through an allotropic phase transformation. I just love saying allotropic. Um, so they go through an allotropic phase transformation where they go from being body-centered cubic to face-centered cubic. So then everything's good to go. All our carbon is dissolved in that face-centered cubic arrangement. Well, then we're going to take it from there, which is about 2,000 degrees, and we're going to cool it down to, you know, four or 500 degrees maybe. Maybe we'll take it to room temperature depending on the process. We're going to slam that temperature down, and that's going to take our temperature or our um, material from a face-centered cubic to a body-centered tetragonal unit arrangement that we've got over here on the far right. You can see it's similar to the body-centered cubic, but it's a little bit skewed. So when we cooled it down, this is how I envision it. It's kind of like playing musical chairs when you're a kid. And when the music's playing, you're in the austenite form. You're in that center form. There's, mo there's nobody sitting down, so there's no worry about finding a hiding place, right? Well, once that music stops, all that carbon, which is the people that are walking around the chairs, they need to find somewhere to go. Well, you have more people than you do chairs. And that's kind of how we end up with body center tetragonal. And I don't know if that analogy or whatever the hell it is um, 
makes any damn sense for the rest of humanity. But for me, that's how I keep track of it. You got more people than you got chairs, and it throws everything off. So that's when we get into body center and tetragonal. Everything's kind of thrown off for a minute, right? We've taken that extra chair out of there and all that carbon scrambling to find a place to go. So that's how we go from body centered cubic to face centered cubic to body centered tetragonal. Hardening steels. Steels are hardened by being heated to a temperature just above the upper transformation temperature, soaked long enough to ensure a completely austenitic structure, and then cooled rapidly. This results in either a fine-grained perlite, bainite, or martensite. If maximum hardness is to be developed, the austenite must be transformed to martensite. Martensite is extremely hard and strong and has great resistance and practically no machinability. Here we've got a picture of martensite, and it's in the body center tetragonal arrangement. So this is what we're looking at. This is what we're talking about when we say martensite or body center tetragonal or a martensitic microstructure. You can see it's got all those little sharp lines in it, and it's, it's I don't know, it is what it is. Um, and I'm sure my uh, university Metallurgy professor Vern Griffiths is rolling over in his grave as I'm talking on YouTube, talking about um, martensite. But yeah, so this is what you're looking at is uh, when they're when they're t discussing martensite. It's in a body center tetragonal arrangement, and then you've got all these little sharp knife-like arrangements in the microstructure of the iron or steel. Quenching, tempering, austempering, martempering. Quenching is a rapid cooling of a metal from an elevated temperature. The quenching media may be oil, water, oil, forced air, and synthetic quenchant. Tempering is reheating a quench hardened or normalized ferrous alloy to an intermediate temperature below the transformation range, followed by cooling at the desired rate. Austempering and martempering are modified versions of the austenizing, quenching, and tempering process. Austempering produces a bainitic mark, mark, microstructure. The primary purses, purpose of martempering is to reduce distortion caused by unequal transformation rates in complex shapes to be quenched. The residual stresses that are locked in a material as a result of cold working, for example, may be relieved by heating to a high temperature suitable for the particular material in question and cooling slowly per to prevent introduction of new residual stresses. When we talk about hardening of steels, we're talking about going from body center tetragonal over here on the far right. We're going to heat it up, up above the upper transformation temperature and then we're going to let it soak and it's going to be in a face-centered cubic arrangement. And then we're going to cool it down and we're going to quench it down to a martensitic or a body-centered tetragonal um, crystal structure. And this is how the whole, I don't know, from way back in time when they were quenching and tempering swords and making spear points and knives, this is the whole damn process. This is how steel is hardened. Somebody figured it out a zillion years ago. Hey, we heat it up. We cool it down real quick. We can get a good knife edge. Oh, but if it, um, if we don't heat it back up again after we've quenched it, it'll be too brittle. So we got to heat it up and kind of take some of the internal stresses out of it. So here you can see we've got the, not just the austenization, then the quenching, and then we've got tempering on there. So, you know, the the upper transformation temperature is 15 to 1600 degrees. So, um, we take it up there and then we let it, everything go into a face-centered cubic um, formation. Let all that carbon find a place to be. And then we shock it. We just quench it. We cool it really quick and we bring it down. And then generally before the part gets too cold, we 
bring it back up and we temper it and then that takes some of the stresses out and softens the material a little bit and gives us a material that's a little more readily usable as a engineering type component. That's why we temper it is to get it so it's usable. It's not just this brittle mass of steel. Tempering. After hardening, most alloys are tempered to reduce brittleness and to relieve some of the high internal stresses developed during hardening. Tempering always follows rather than precedes the hardening process. Tempering occasionally is done after materials have been normalized, but its major use is after hardening. Since tempering uses temperatures below the lower transformation point, the rate of cooling is generally has no effect upon the structure of the materials. So we're not taking the material, when we temper it, we're not taking it back up into an austenitic form. We just got this glob of, when I say glob, this structure of body-centered tetragonal martensitic material, which is hard as hell, and we're going to heat it up to a few hundred degrees and soften it and relieve some of the internal stresses and basically try and make that microstructure happy so that we've got a usable engineering type material, not just something that's super freaking hard and is going to shatter and give us all kinds of problems later on. That's what we're doing with tempering. We've already got um, some hardness and some strength in the material, but we need to soften it and bring it into a, a little more manageable and usable condition is why we are tempering that material. Tempering. After hardening, most alloys are tempered to reduce brittleness and to relieve some of the high internal stresses developed during hardening. Tempering always follows rather than precedes the hardening process. Tempering is occasionally done after materials have been normalized, but its major use is after hardening. After a steel is hardened, it is too brittle for ordinary purposes. Some of the badness should be removed and toughness induced. This process of reheating quench hardened steel to a temperature below the transformation range and then cooling it at any rate desired is called tempering. The metal must be heated uniformly to a predetermined temperature depending on the toughness desired. As tempering temperature increases, toughness increases and hardness decreases. The temperature range is usually between 730 and 750 degrees Fahrenheit. And it can be as high as 1100 degrees F. So when you have a quenched and tempered material, just remember the higher you get that tempering temperature, the softer you're making the material. You're making it more ductile and tougher, but you're losing your hardness. So it's a balancing act. Um, there's a lot of literature out there on um, quenching and tempering different steels and the different temperatures you should do it at. And, the times it should take, etc. Calculating the travel speed. This isn't, you know, rocket surgery here. When you're calculating the travel speed, you just have you get your welder that's going to be welding your uh, your PQR, and have him weld a length of weld. You set your weld parameters. You do a little pre-calculation, and then you see how you see how far he can weld in a minute or two minutes, and then. Uh, you know, if he welds 25 inches in two minutes, that's 12.5 inches per minute. And then you just take that and you plug it back into your um, weld calculation on your little spreadsheet. And then that'll give you your heat input for that distance of weld. Here's an example of a heat input calculation. It's not too difficult. You're just taking 60 times the amps times the volts. And then you're dividing it by 1,000 multiplied by the travel speed. And the travel speed is in inches per minute. Um, so for an example, 150 amps, 30 volts, and 3 inches a minute of travel speed. So 60 by multiplied by 150 by 30 divided by 1,000, which is multiplied by 3, gives us 90 kilojoules an inch. Most of you are probably relatively computer savvy. I would the best way I found to do this is to build yourself a little spreadsheet and go from there because you can put in you know to really dial in on what you want your numbers to be. It's a lot easier to 
you know, mass calculate things on a spreadsheet. So that's how I do most of my um, heat input calculations when I've needed to do them. Just put together a little spreadsheet and go from there, and it can give you, you know, 10 different scenarios in regards to amperage, voltage, travel speeds that, you know, might help you hit the target you're looking for. When I do a PQR or a WPS, it's going to require um, heat input for what I did during the qualification process. I generally put together a spreadsheet or a log that looks like this, and then I just keep track of it. Um, I worked at one place where we do, it, it would take days to do these um, qualifications, the PQRs, because we were doing duplex blocks blocks of duplex stainless steels that were inches thick and I'm talking six eight inches thick so you couldn't get the the inner pass temperature couldn't be up above a couple hundred degrees you know 225 250 I forget what the number was but it wasn't very damn hot and it would take a lot of passes a lot of weld passes to fill this thing in so We'd have a guy with a clipboard, and he'd just fill this out, and then I'd plug it all into our this spreadsheet, and it would calculate it out for us. So this is how I would keep track of it. Um, this is just one example of being able to, you know, your documentation when you're doing your procedure qualification record. Build yourself a little pre, uh, spreadsheet and keep track of the information on the spreadsheet. Here's another heat input spreadsheet that I put together, you know, back in the day for, you know, um, when I was doing procedure qualification records, um, a lot of PQRs, just keep track of the information that was going on when I, because a lot of times it wouldn't be me tracking it, um, it I'd have an assistant, so this way I knew I, I had, va my data was valid or, um, organized all right dude just fill out this sheet i could give it to you know any number of different people and they could do it in a proficient manner so something to think about putting your toolkit excessive heat input excessive heat input during welding can also be detrimental to a weld therefore a controlled heat input is a must for a good weld cracks may result from welding processes involving large heat inputs in the arc welding processes, the heat input is lowered by reducing the current or by increasing the travel speed while maintaining the same current level. This explanation then reveals to us that the stringer bead is far superior to the weaving method in which the forward travel is drastically reduced while the current level remains this constant. So it's telling us that we want to use stringer beads because we're moving faster and we're not putting as much heat into the material. Weave beads are bad, stringer beads are good. Heat input control for quenched and tempered steels. When quenched and tempered steels are welded, the heat input shall be restricted in conjunction with the maximum preheat and interpass temperatures required. Such considerations shall include additional heat input produced in simultaneous welding on the two sides of a common member. The preceding limitations shall be in conformance with the producer's recommendation. So this is out of AWS D1.1 and it's just telling us that we need to keep track of the heat input control for um, quenched and tempered steels. Because if you don't, there's going to be some serious consequences or there could be some serious consequences um, if you don't do it correctly. ASTM A514 steels, suggested preheat and interpass temperatures. When welding T1 steels, A514 steels, the total welding heat input must be equal to or less than the values given in tables 3 and 4. Given the preheat temperature and the base metal thickness, and the above heat input formula can be used to ensure that the heat input remains within the limits given the, in the table. The heat input can be adjusted by decreasing welding amperage and voltage or by increasing the welding speed. Note the total heat input referenced in tables 3 and 4 applies to individual weld passes and is not considered cumulative. So you don't just, every weld pass, it doesn't stack up. It's just a one-time shot. 
So you heat, you weld with that one, you let it cool down below the maximum inner pass temperature, and you start again. So this is from Technical Bulletin, a, UN, a U.S. Army uh, Technical Bulletin 9-2510-242-40. It's a technical bulletin on how to um, fix trailers that they haul heavy equipment and what on. So that material that they use on these trailers is, AS, is different grades of ASTM A514. So for this example, you can see that the electrodes recommended are all XXX, 15, 16, 18, and 28, meaning that they want um, material that's got 100,000 tensile or greater. Um, for our example, I'm going to use a one inch material. So it's going to tell us our minimum preheat and inner pass temperature needs to be 125. And our maximum preheat and inner pass temperature can be 400. So I can use 150, I can use 200, I can use 300. For this example, I'm going to use a preheat of 150. And as you, if you go along, and I'm going to use a 150, and let's say it's an inch thick material. So the green on table four, you can see I've got one inch thick material going in that horizontal or vertical column in the green. And then as I come across in the red um, from 150 degree preheat, you can see what my maximum heat input in kilojoules can, per inches can be. So that intersects at 120. I can't have more than 120 kilojoules of heat per inch going into this material. So we take our 120 um, kilojoules per inch as our maximum welding heat input. And I crunched that. I threw in some numbers to try and get um, a heat input that would be less than that so you can see i've got there on the left i've got shielded metal arc welding pass one i went with 150 amps 34 volts and then a 2.5 inches per minute travel speed well that gave me 122 kilojoules of heat per inch which is above our 120. well so then let's say I get my welder to speed it up a little from 2.5 to 3 inches per minute of travel speed. That takes me down from a heat input of 122 to 102, so then I'm good. So like I said, this is um, a uh, U.S. Army technical bulletin, but this runs pretty, uh, pretty much parallel to AWS D1.1. I'm not saying they're interchangeable, but the concepts are pretty much the same in regards to what you do with this material and how you weld it and the need to keep the inner pass temperatures low. So um, just another resource if you need it or want to read through it. But gives you another idea that um, what you need to do on welding this steel and it's a little more graphical form, and it's more in the form of instructions, whereas D1.1 is a code, and this technical bulletin is meant for guys with about a 7th grade reading level out fixing trucks for the U.S. Army. And no, that wasn't a slam at my brothers from the U.S. Army either. Um, it's just the level that these uh, military manuals are written in. The Navy and the Army, I think they write them at about a 7th, 8th grade level. Stringer bead versus weave bead technique. It is desirable to minimize the heat input while welding T1 steels. With the stringer bead method, weld beads are deposited in a straight line. With the weave bead method, weld beads are deposited in a zigzag formation. The use of stringer beads reduces the amount of heat input because the forward weld travel speed is faster. Therefore, the stringer bead technique should be used instead of the weave bead technique. The exception to the stringer bead requirement occurs when welding in a vertical position. In this case, a partial weave bead technique may be used to facilitate welding. However, the total weave bead shall not be greater than twice the electrode diameter. So the one outlined in green is a stringer bead technique. That's what we want to use. 
we don't want to use these wide zigzagging um, weave beads where you just keep, you know, you've got a really wide um, weave bead and you're depositing metal and you're just cooking the hell out of that base metal and the HAZ. So that's why we want to use a stringer bead. You're just welding and then getting the hell out of there and allowing the base metal and the HAZ to cool down. So this is the difference in the two different techniques. Preheat and welding heat input. Excessive preheat and welding heat input causes T1 steel to become brittle, resulting in severe loss of strength. It is desirable to use low total heat input and allow the base metal to cool quickly. This results in a small increase in hardness without the brittleness. Heat generated in the base metal weld area should be monitored by the use of temperature indicating crayons or their equivalent to avoid excessive heat input and resultant brittleness and loss of properties. So when we're talking about T1, this came out of a military manual and that's what they call ASTM A514, quench and tempered steels. And to monitor your preheat and interpass temperature, you use these heat crayons. I don't, I don't know who out there has used them. So if you haven't, basically you just wipe them on the, it's like a crayon you use to color when you're a kid. And they got different temperatures associated with them. And you just wipe it on the material. And if it's hotter than the temperature that it says on the crayon, then it'll melt. And if, it, if you haven't reached the melting point of the crayon, the crayon won't melt. So usually you have half a dozen of these, five or six of them, and you just swipe them on there so it'll give you an idea. Another way is they've got those laser beam thermometers that you can point at it, and it you know kicks back a temperature for you. But these are some um, ways to monitor heat input. Okay, we covered quite a bit of ground there in regards to quenched and tempered steels and heat input. Um, we talked a little bit about metallurgy of quenched and tempered steels and why we don't want to put a lot of heat in there when we're welding them because you're going to mess up the um, base material and the heat affected zone and you're going to have issues in regards to cracking because these are quenched and tempered steels. Um, the people that make this material have gone through great pains to process these quench and tempered steels to give them a very specific set of mechanical properties and when you're welding if you don't weld correctly use the right processes filler metals and whatnot you'll damage the material and pretty much make it useless so these are things we need to keep in mind while welding quenched and tempered steels <laughs>